Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, October 15th, 2020. I'm your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brain. Sometimes we get papers and press releases where cool news and the news they are trying to push through the press release are not the exact same thing. Today, we received a pair of press releases about a new paper in astronomy and astrophysics concerning the relationship between the formation of large rocky worlds and Jupiter-like planets at middle distances in solar systems. The headline states that Earth-like planets are often, um, Earth-like planets often come with a bodyguard. And then they go on to discuss new computer models being created at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy. If you're a longtime audience member of this show, you know that computer models currently are pretty bad at describing planetary formation. And observation after observation finds that solar systems form in ways we did not anticipate. So when I saw this title and an article lead talking about computer models, I was intrigued because this implied something we've long suspected to be true about solar systems can be re reproduced in models, which would be awesome. And then I read things in detail and realized, nope. What they have is a review of observations that shows that in the Venn diagram of solar system layouts, 30% of systems observed to have large rocky worlds also have a cold Jupiter. And every system with a cold Jupiter has a large rocky planet. Now, put another way, if a cold Jupiter is present, there's going to be a large rocky world. But there are also systems, in fact, there are more than twice as many observed systems that have a large rocky world that has no cold Jupiter. And the simulations discussed in the story lead, they do not match reality. Nope, not at all. They ran 1,000 simulations of planetary systems that evolved in a protoplanetary disk around a sun-like star. Instead of all the cold Jupiters having rocky worlds, only 30% of the simulated cold Jupiters had large rocky worlds. And uh, in the simulations, instead of 30% of the large rocky worlds having cold Jupiters, only 10% of the rocky worlds had large Jupiters. Um, the reason, and here I quote the press release, one explanation has to do with the rate at which gas planets gradually migrate inward. Planet formation theory seems to predict higher rates than observed, leading to an increased accumulation of gas giants on orbits of intermediate distance. In the simulations, these warm Jupiters interfere with the inner orbit and cause more super-Earths to be ejected or even collide in galactic collisions, with a slightly lower tendency of the simulated gas planets to migrate. More of the super-Earths would remain, which would be more compatible with the observations. Okay, that was a lot of words, and here's the thing. These simulations have been done over recent years, not weeks. And our understanding of how solar systems form is changing rapidly. So rapidly that these folks are missing key information. Things like the fact that planets and stars seem to evolve side by side with similar initial formation dates beyond having a mismatch in timelines, the simulations also, like all simulations, can't accurately reproduce planetary migration because we just don't completely understand planetary migration. This is a cool note. It's a story of, hey, if you have a cool Jupiter, if you have a cold Jupiter, you're going to have a large rocky world. This is cool science. This is a cool publication. 
This implies something fundamental about how forming gas giants influence the formation of smaller bodies. The fact that only 30% of large rocky worlds have that cold Jupiter, that also implies there are either multiple formation mechanisms for these giant or rather large, large rocky worlds, or there are mechanisms for eradicating cold Jupiters from view, or maybe both. That's also cool. This is just not the focus of the press release. The cool science is not the focus of the press release. The reality is, folks most likely got funding to do extensive modeling of solar system formation, and they absolutely did the best they could. They did the best of their ability with the incomplete data we have. Having completed their work, they needed to publish the results, and they have results. But when your simulations and reality don't entirely match, well, this kind of press release is what you get. It has cool results, just not the ones they were probably hoping for. Ideally, you want simulations and reality to match. But science progresses slowly. It progresses both through successes and through things that go slightly sideways. And these models go slightly sideways. It all contributes. And now we know these particular models are missing some key ingredient needed to describe our reality. And our reality is kind of cool. Switching topics entirely. We have another story. Um, that takes us from planetary disks to galactic disks. In a new paper appearing in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society with lead author Shifu Zhu, researchers are able to tease out the physics behind why some rapidly spinning supermassive black holes have jets and others do not. This is one of those cases where all systems with jets are rapidly rotating, but not all rapidly rotating systems have jets. When a supermassive black hole and its associated disk of infalling material are rapidly rotating, the moving charge particles can generate a powerful magnetic field. Material caught in the magnetic field can be ejected out the rotation axes of the system and inject huge amounts of energy into the galaxy's surroundings. In this study, um, 729 quasars with jets were observed in X-ray using the Chandra, XMM, Newton, and Rosat space telescopes. Uh, They were also observed in radio with a very large array and optically with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Putting all this data together, well, according to Zhu, lead author on this study, they found... Um, There's another determining factor of whether a supermassive black hole has jets, something called a black hole corona threaded by magnetic fields. If you don't have a black hole corona that's bright in x-rays, it seems like you don't have powerful black hole jets. These black hole coronas don't circle the black hole so much as um, lay above and below the accretion disk surrounding the black hole. Zhu goes on to explain, both the quasar's powerful jets and bright corona occurring together may be fundamentally driven by magnetic fields. One of the big takeaways from this research is that quasar jets don't emerge at the disk, but instead come out from higher up in the disk's corona. Co-author Gyang Yang explains, Finding that the X-rays and quasars with jets come from a black hole corona rather than from jets challenges 35 years of thinking about the basic nature of this emission. It could provide new insights into the physics of these jets. The more we see of our universe, the more we see our own minor and sometimes major mistakes in our understanding of the universe. This is a minor update that makes it possible to finally understand the sporadic nature of jet creation around rapidly rotating supermassive black holes. Now, our final story of the day uh, reminds us that 
even the fundamentals of star formation and star cluster formation like to periodically mess with our understanding of how things work. Today is just a story of science that turns out doesn't quite match our expectations. While it's been understood pretty much as long as we've understood stellar metallicities, the content in stars, that stars in globular clusters don't have a lot of heavy elements, uh, we thought there was a floor, a lower limit to just how metal poor these systems could go. Um, essentially, when the raw material of the universe formed the first few generations of stars, it didn't form globular clusters at the same time. And uh, the dynamics associated with globular cluster formation only occurred after a minor amount of stellar material processing had occurred. That's what we thought. Well, apparently, the universe decided it didn't need no stinking metal enrichment for at least one super metal poor globular cluster to form. Astronomers using the high rise spectrometer on the Keck telescope had a couple of extra hours. And this is my favorite part of the story. They'd had a planned observing run, they'd budgeted in extra time for things to go wrong, for clouds, for technical issues, and they got everything done and they still had a couple of hours. So they pointed the telescope at a globular cluster in the Andromeda system, globular cluster RBVC EXT. Eight. It's not a great name. Well, what they found is that this system is three times less metal rich than your typical globular cluster. And globular clusters are already 800 times less metal rich than our sun. So this is a super metal poor system. This accidental discovery is published in the journal Science with lead author Soren Larson. This is yet another example of our universe not letting us get too comfortable in our understanding of how things work. Like I said, theme for the day. It is unclear if this is a random pocket of unprocessed gas that hung around and eventually got shocked into forming a globular cluster without forming metal enriching stars in the process, or if this is just some really weird, rare situation we haven't anticipated. Whatever is happening, when we finally get the observations needed to explain the weirdness of what's going on, we'll bring them to you here. Until then, this has been today's Daily Space.